Hello and welcome to Hampton 3 Gallery Coffee and Conversation. Today we're talking with Philip Mullen. Philip is one of the few South Carolinian artists to be featured in a Whitney Biennial. He's shown in New York and LA and he's a longtime professor at USC. The featured show here is called Red and White. And Philip, why don't you tell us about those two colors and why you chose them? Basically, I think of these paintings as abstract paintings. I sort of hang them on a framework of subject matter. The earliest three paintings in the show are these two longer ones here with the red and white and then this one. The idea was very simply bright cadmium red and white. It's interesting, even with the paint, I have to use get to Utrecht red, which is now selling for $92 a pint because stuff like the golden red, cadmium red, has almost no relationship to it, nowhere near the brightness, some of the other things. And so it was simply a matter of taking the abstract idea, red, white, together. I was interviewed once, and they, they, they said to me, when you start a painting, do you know what it'll look like when it ends? And my immediate answer was, I barely know where I'm headed when I start. I barely know what it's going to look like when I start. You know, it's one of the hardest things is starting paintings. I remember as an undergraduate student in the early 60s in Minnesota, I realized that getting started was the hardest part. And so what I'd do is I'd stretch up about a dozen canvases, I'd lay them out on the ground, turn my back to them, and throw paint over my shoulder. Ruined them all, but they were started. Now I'm a little different in how I start them because I don't feel so intimidated now. One of the, you know, I used to tell my students that when they were so concerned about paintings coming out successfully, I'd say, I'm really concerned about your paintings coming out successfully too. Now, if they were mine, I wouldn't be concerned because, you know, I know I've ruined a lot. I, I'm going to ruin a lot more. But, you know, if I ruin one painting, it's, you know, like such a small percentage of what I've done. And, you know, I understand this is like, you know, one of five pieces you've done. It's important. One of the reasons I get to be the teacher is because of all the paintings I've screwed up. And in order for that to work for you, you're going to have to eventually be able to relax into letting them screw up. Now, I feel perfectly happy going back and revisiting paintings, regardless of how old they are. I look at it as like, you know, you have a conversation with somebody. It ends. You get home. You think, gee, something I could have added to that. You get together with them again. It starts up again. I guess it didn't end. I, there's nothing exactly sacred or anything about finished on a painting. Well, speaking of starting, Philip, do you want to talk about how you started the one in the center, how that began <laughs> its life? That, that actually is, have, have all of you seen the catalog? Yeah, well, yeah, Luke actually reproduced this one in the center with his very nice statement that he did in there. And that started out as a figurative painting. It was a really... The first day on it was really good. It's hard when the first day's good because then, you know, what do you do? You know, it's not rich enough. It's not built enough. But if you push it on, you know for sure that it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so it, a good first day, you know, sometimes has to sit for a while before you can get back to it and make, make it happen. And as you look at it, in the catalog, how it develops, that answers the question actually in many ways much better. Now, in terms of feeling free to go back to them, I've got a painting that's in a collection in Oregon. I finished it three different times, <laughs> and it was in publications all three times. So it exists out there in all of its forms. To oversimplify, it was a colorful horizontal landscape first time. Second time, it was a very subtle still life, vertical still life. In the end, it was a interference color laden still life, but not the same still life that was in the initial one. Any of you who are at all curious about this, and we can't do it easily here, but you need to see some of the photos that Sandy has and see how these paintings looked in former lives. And in this show, there's one painting that sets for me 
all-time new record in how long it took to paint. 45 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's the one with the green border here. Those gold lines you see on the bottom and that green, which when you look at that green close, you're going to find it's actually red in that green, which is odd. It's a complementary color. That was painted 45 years ago. The small marks in the white section were painted 45 years ago. I can't paint like that anymore. The flowers and the vase, those flowers, the petals that float out, those were painted this year. I couldn't paint like that 45 years ago. But they go together well. I wish I had more paintings from that era that I could go back and revisit like that, you know. I guess I could start some kind of paintings and hope that 45 years ago, from now, I can go back <laughs> and touch them up, do something different with them. My favorite part of that painting is the fallen petals against the shadow and the way the texture creates like a 2.5D effect. Yeah. It's flat and 3D at the same time. I don't know how you did that. It's frustrating. <laughs> I don't know that I'm sure about it. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that's one of the nice things about focusing on the process of making it and letting each step of the journey sort of unfold. If I had any notion where they were going, I don't think I could make myself do them. I'd be bored to death. But it's that seeking out where it's going. It's, and you can liken it to a conversation with someone. You go into it, you may have a little bit of an idea. You may have no idea. But it takes on a life of its own. Things develop. You know, you have to listen to the painting to see that happen. And there's a lot of things that develop. Most of the things that develop don't work. So you go on. But every once in a while, taking those chances, it just it gives you, it gives you a, a discovery that you just wouldn't have had otherwise. I was teaching at the University of South Carolina from 69 uh, to 2000. About 15 years after I retired, they invited me back to sit on a one MFA committee because they didn't feel they had anybody on the faculty that filled it out quite right. And at the Bernard Kruzman was the student's name in that case. And Chris Robinson, who was the chair of the committee, who had invited me back early on, he said, all painters are either idea, process, or product-oriented. Now, I think probably most painters have a balance of all three of some sort. And he said, which are you? And Bernard's like, oh, I, 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 you know. And I said, come on, Bernard, it's easy. I said, if you ask me, I'm process. And, of course, Bernard was process too, actually. That's why they invited me back for that. But it has to do with like a major focus on them. I mean, I'm interested in that adventure of how, to, how I get there. And I found out, interestingly enough, that even some artists who are really, really good artists are surprised to see what rabbit trails these things take to get done. And the thing I think is important about those rabbit trails is they leave traces, and it adds a kind of depth to them. Yeah, if you look at the one in the book, the curtain that's behind the model is still up at the top of the painting because that was originally a portrait of a woman in a chair. And the curtain up at the very top line that's kind of almost obscured now. That is one of the features of one of the first parts of that painting's life. Before we jump to questions, I want to touch on one other thing that I find fascinating about your work, and it's your relationship between object and atmosphere. A lot of painters that do still lives think about, like, how do I put atmosphere around the object? You're really focused on the atmosphere, and yeah. you're using the object to get to the atmosphere. Right. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Let's do it on a two-dimensional basis first before mm -hmm. we get into a three dimension. If we do this, you see two hands. Once I do this, you start to see the space between those hands. These are like markers to see the space. Now sometimes, I, I once assigned an advanced drawing class. I assigned them the project of doing drawings of air. Yeah, I never made that mistake twice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> Point being, if I say, look at this point here. Now, look at this point here. 
Okay, look back at the first point. Look back at the second point. It's a lot harder to look back at the second point, wasn't it? Yeah, I want to have things in the paintings, ways that I can define those points. When you see this in progress, it, it shows another thing that often happens, and that is that in the development of the pieces, they are generally much more detailed at some earlier stage. The last parts of this, which are the really challenging parts, done with a four-inch wide brush, and they're a matter of painting this atmosphere so that it overwhelms the objects, and the objects become three-dimensional markers, they become markers for where that atmosphere is. And when I say three-dimensional, if we're talking like this and my hand's back here, it, you pretty much are looking at my face, the hand's not in it, it's a little weird, but yeah. But if I put it up here, now it's all in the picture. The final development of this piece, which one of the later things that happened was two cockatiels turned into two bouquets of flowers. And when they were cockatiels, you would see the cockatiels, but it wouldn't encourage you back into the buildings. You know, it's interesting to say, I think this happens in a painting, you know, because you need to look at it and confirm, oh, yeah, okay, the guy made this up, or, yeah, it does happen this way. But I think now one tends to start, go in at the buildings and back out to the flowers. And that has to do... It's like, it's like what we're talking about this way, only now it's talking about it dimensionally, three-dimensionally. All right, let's open it up to questions. Who would like to start? I'd like to hear a little bit more and maybe we'll I think that would be a little bit like if there's a subject that we were talking about. You know, like we decided we're going to go to lunch ten times and talk about this subject. And we'd be pretty much clearly on it at first. But then rabbit trails would start to come in and the initial idea not be as strong there. And what happens is we're talking, and you think of something that I didn't think about, and it moves the conversation over. I think of something you didn't think about, moves the conversation over. And I think that's pretty much what happens in these. When I was doing them, this painting back here with the yellow-orange flowers, I was headed for red flowers on that. But... I got a little yellow in there, you know, and it just sort of shifted the conversation over there. Once that had been shifted over, well, then the one in the corner happened, the one in this other corner happened, one back here happened. It is, oh, yeah, this is another avenue that can be opened up here. And I think that's one of the advantages of allowing the conversation with the painting to be open and not just coming in and if somebody takes up art as a hobby, it's a great hobby to take up. You know, you do it way late into life. But very often, the sort of archetype for it is coloring book. And so the person will start by doing a drawing, which is basically producing their own coloring book and then coloring it in. That's very limiting in terms of the kind of interaction you can get in a painting, and it's, it's very focused on the subject. But I want this to really be open to having more things come in. It produces a lot more failures, but it, there are many things that failed in this show. There was one painting that got cut into, I, I cut it up into shreds. It went out with the garbage, you know. On that subject of failures, I'll just, this is sort of just a funny story. When I was in graduate, when I was doing my master's degree, now, I can't remember the last painting I sold, but I do remember the two paintings I sold during my master's degree. You know, it was early. It was important. <laughs> Roland Gibson bought one for $100, and a person whose name I don't remember who worked in the library at the school bought one for $75. Somebody comes to me one day and says, oh, I see, uh, Charlie Skibo has one of your artworks. I'm like, no, Charlie didn't buy one of my artworks. How, how did he get that? Well, he found it in your garbage. <laughs> and I said, I'd rather he'd stolen a good one instead of having, <laughs> having that on his wall. And so I'm not going to let this happen again. So as paintings got destroyed over the years, I'd take them off and roll them up, and I kept storing them. Eventually, I had in my storage room 
I had a pile that was basically seven feet deep because uh, these are smaller paint. Those of you who know my work realize that this is a show of smaller paintings that often happen. My two middle-sized paintings were this size and this size. And I've done single canvas. I mean, I shipped a single canvas 15-foot wide piece to a museum in Korea once. Really big. You know one of the interesting things about taking rabbit trails? Sometimes you forget where you're headed. You were talking about destroying paintings, and you had a pile of them. Yeah, Yeah. so this pile is seven feet deep, four feet high, almost three feet wide, hundreds and hundreds of paintings over many years. So I said, God, what am I going to do to get rid of these? So I decided I'd get a tree company and hire them to bring out one of their grinders to grind them up. And I finally got a tree company to come out. It got out there. As the third one went in, it totally jammed their thing. I mean, they can chop up trees, but they can't chop up acrylic paintings. (laughs) (laughs) So we had to give up on that. Eventually... (laughs) I've got this yard man who I have a great relationship with. I'm guessing it partially comes from the fact that after, shortly after he started working for me, I loaned him an extra car I had for two weeks when he was in trouble with stuff. But I, I just mentioned to him this problem. I'll bring my boys over. We'll cut them up with scissors. <laughs> <laughs> so one Saturday, I had all these yard guys in my studio with scissors cutting them up and ended up with this enormous pile. I mean, it was as wide as this table and as high. And then for the next uh, three and a half months, I fed portions of it out with the garbage <laughs> every week. <laughs> I'm going to get your question, but I'm going to restate the last question so that we <laughs> know how oh, we I how we got it. No, no, that. it's okay. I'm going to try to get it. From the, but the question was about color palettes and how do you choose, say, red and white as a palette to start a show versus another palette? What, how's your movement between palettes go? Okay, now your question, and I'll repeat this one. So the question is, how do you define a, a failed painting? When do you know that a painting can't be saved? I'm a little looser with that definition than that. Certainly when it is at the point where I have to take it off the stretcher and cut it up and send the shreds out, that's really failed. There's other times when I can make use of them and work over them. One time, the two biggest galleries in long-term relationships I had were with David Finley in New York. And my shows there at their biggest tended to have over 40 paintings in them with probably 45% this size, 45% this size, a few bigger ones, and occasionally a smaller one. I had a very hard time for many years succeeding at anything smaller than this. And I, for some reason, committed to shows with both galleries simultaneously. And 45 paintings into it and months of months of work now, and I will tell you, even though I taught at the university for 31 years, I took nine years of leave. I did not teach summers, you know, because I needed time for this. And fortunately, it worked out well for the university and me. But all of a sudden, I realized these paintings weren't good enough. I was not willing to show them. They were basically failed paintings, 41 of them. So I called both galleries, and I said, uh, I got a little situation here. And I'm, I'm like this really dependable guy who shows up with stuff when I'm going to. They were both very nice about it. They both responded the same. I, I told, you know, I said, I can only do one of the shows, obviously. And they were really nice about it. They both said, yeah, that's, that's fine. Do ours. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, oh, well, okay. So I made a deal with them both that if they accepted the smallest shows possible, I would hire people to do anything in the studio somebody other than me could do. And we went on that basis. Now, some of those paintings, they were unstretched, and canvas was restretched on those stretchers by somebody else other than me. I mean, one of the people I hired to destroy them said, this is really weird. Some of the paintings I was able to work over and make something happen with them. I think of all of them as kind of failed at that point when I thought they were done and all. So it's, it's kind of, I, I'll use that term a little loosely. I never gesso over them, and because if I go on, there's something there that can add to the new painting. This 45-year painting is a great example of that, especially, I mean, in that case, I can pick out and show you parts. This was painted 45 years ago. This was painted this year. 
sometimes, and one of the things that wrecks them the most is that they can get texture on them that's unworkable for something else. The only paintings that I find I cannot shift on are the koi paintings. You, you see this one of them up here. In, it's up in the front. You can't see it from where you are, but you, as you're going out. And I've only ever shifted the subject on one of those paintings. And the shift was, I can't even call it a real shift. And what had happened was I tried one small, and it just there wasn't enough room for the koi to move in. And so I turned it into a painting of a big vase of koi on it. Yeah, but that texture, if those don't work, they, they end up getting unstretched. That texture just, you can't get rid of the presence of it. Anybody else? Okay, so the question's about the emotional aspect of working through a painting. So how does emotion work into your process? I heard the sculptor Richard Lippold talk one time. And he said, I'm suspicious of any work that I do in which I don't have an orgasm. And what he meant, it wasn't a sexual comment. It was a comment that you hit a point. It's best if it's a surprise. You hit a point, you're working along, it's sort of mundane stuff, and all of a sudden it's magic. To describe more fully that, when I'm starting, it is now pretty much a mechanical process of getting stuff on the canvas. It's an updated version of throwing it over the shoulder. And that's just mechanics. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a point that that painting says back to me. It says, here's the personality I want to have. And it seldom says it very loud at that point. But what I try to do then is move it further into that personality. And sometimes it's that sort of wonderful blast is small. Best though, sometimes it, it just, you don't see it coming and it just hits you and you run into the house and say, Jane, get out of here. You got to see this painting. <laughs> awesome. Anybody else? No other artist has ever been in the Whitney Biennial while living in the state of South Carolina. I mean, there's people like Jasper Johns who lived here, and he certainly got in the Whitney Biennial more often than I did. What happened was they got some money that year because there was a lot of complaints that the Biennial was always being chosen, mainly from New York, L.A., Chicago, and a few other big places. And in case you, any of you are not familiar with it, the Whitney Biennial was certainly then probably the most prestigious invitational show in the country. The closest they got to Columbia was Atlanta, and they chose two people from Atlanta for it that year, Ed Ross, who actually lived in Atlanta, and Lucky Me, who had a show up in Atlanta. Yeah. I didn't do art as a kid. I went to nine schools before I got out of high school. I graduated in the lower half of my high school class. University of Minnesota, fortunately, had to accept anybody who had graduated any high school in the state at that time. And so I was accepted provisionally. I realized, of course, that I did not have a shot at ever getting through college, but there I was. So I thought, you know, I'm here. I think I'll go hang out with my friend Mike. He's an art major. I went over there, and I found out that, the, like, the beginning classes were not fun, but the art majors had to take them. But I wasn't an art major. So I talked myself into having them letting me start in a junior-level painting course. I don't know why they did it. But the guy who I was talking to used to had to talk to an actual professor to do this. He didn't want to do it. And I'm kind of persistent. And he finally says, okay, okay, I'll sign you up for it. And under his breath, he said, in the other guy's section. And the other guy turned out to be Ed Corbett. Ed Corbett was, when the Museum of Modern Art did one of the early shows of abstract expressionism, with 16 in it, he was there. One of the reviewers said he was the best in the show. He eventually moved to the West Coast. You know, I've got a book of his show he had out there. It was sponsored in part by Richard Diebenkorn, in part by Elmer Bischoff, names you may have heard. So, man, I got the best right away. And then I got another guy, Peter Boozer. 
quite different, but both had involved with the abstract expressionist movement. I mean, Boozer was in the Ninth Street show. I think he was best man at Pollock's first wedding. And we've got somebody here. Actually, when I was in Boozer's class, he did a little drawing for me, and she now owns it because her, was it your doctorate? Your, yeah, she, Boozer was one somebody she was writing about on her master's, so I, when I had to show it Burris shape, and I, I knew that she would preserve this drawing better than I was going to. I mean, it was just a little class sketch. But these guys, these guys, New York was it. And so I took it the next year off of teaching. I figured that being in the biennial was a ticket into a New York gallery, and that was in my mind where I needed to be. It turned out it was not a ticket into a New York gallery, but what it was was it was a ticket into making me think I was good enough to be in a New York gallery. I went there. I rented a loft space, and, you know, I spent the year painting and trying to get into galleries. And fortunately, I got into David Finley galleries, which turned out I had 35 years with them till they closed when they finally had no family members alive that could run it. I had 14 solo shows with them and a 15th show in New York, which they lined up for me with in a gallery that one of their former employees had opened. Do you want to talk about where one of your studios in New York was? Well, it was my only studio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this was pure coincidence. I ended up running three quarters of Andy Warhol's old factory. And you had a chance to meet him, and what happened? <laughs> he was down to... Actually, I'd see him on the street a lot. We had a mutual friend, David Bourdon, who had been the art critic for Newsweek, and he was at the Village Voice at that time. And he had done major writing on uh, Warhol and on Christo. And so through David Bourdon, Warhol invited me to come to a studio in the condition that I shaved my beard. Of course, I did not go to a studio. <laughs> Isabel Bishop, who some of you may be familiar with, she was also on Union Square. I mean, Warhol had just moved. He was a half a block away in a different uh, space on Union Square then. But Isabel Bishop was on the square. She was a little more pleasant to visit. She let me come with the beard. Anybody else? The questions about mark making and layering, how that goes into your work. I think they're absolutely key to it. On the mark making, it doesn't occur here, but with my first New York show, I was dividing the canvases into little sections, and I was putting the same painting in each section. Now, I had one piece this size in that show, and I, I only happen to remember the number of sections in it because I actually wrote it on this part of the canvas. It had 1,350 sections in it which means every time I committed to doing one stroke, I committed to doing it 1,350 times. I didn't cheat. I didn't dip and try to get two because the weight of the paint, the way it fell, would be different. It meant that every mark I committed to, I would be making that mark for the next two and a half to four hours. Now, 15 minutes into it, I'm like, oh, what am I doing here? Half hour into it, I'm like, why would anybody want to do anything except this with their life? You know, it became a meditative process. But my point here is that I try to make all the mark making incredibly conscientious. For a group of paintings that preceded this, for example, on walls, where I wanted, was putting thick paint and carving into it with the back of the brush, instead of just making marks like this, I copied hieroglyphics from inside pyramids. Not that you can read them, but it made me have to be conscientious about it. And everybody may not be able to see the difference of that, but somebody like you, as a printmaker, conscious of those marks, you would know the difference between that as conscientious and not. It was the other question about layering. I like to have that sense that you can see some of the history of the painting with the layering. I was in the Chicago Art Institute one time. There was a Picasso blue period of an interior, and there clearly had been a figure where there was now a wall. I mean, that's the part I remember, is that figure that wasn't there. It's like if you and I went to your childhood bedroom and we looked around, we'd be looking at the same thing, but we wouldn't be seeing the same thing. You'd have layers there that I didn't have. And it was like Picasso had let me in one of those layers, you know? That's kind of the purpose of building them 
and the notion of why I freely want to paint over other things, never just sewing it out, but making use of what's there. And, you know, some people say, well, why don't you just save the old one and do a new one? You can't do that. You don't have the layers in. I think paint peeling and layering and stuff like that, I've had that response, not necessarily New York, but it's a more general thing. To kind of pick up what you're talking about, if you're interested in seeing some of that mark making that Philip's talking about, we have some works on paper that I think kind of feature the marks that you're talking about around the corner. I think there's some monotypes. And oh, actually, they're, yeah, they're the silk screens on handmade paper. Yep. Yeah, and they're gorgeous. When I did those silk screens, the largest edition I ever ran of them, they are all on handmade paper. And the handmade paper can be anywhere from just barely handmade enough to be allowed to be called handmade paper to, I mean, in one case, I had this guy named Darn Farnsworth out in California who was making paper for me. I sent him a thing. I said, and this is on probably the best of the 43 silk screens I did. I said, cotton base, grind in 15 colors of silk, air dry, so it's rough, extremely exaggerated deckle. So, I mean, these things are like hanging off the edge of it like this. And printmakers generally don't go for that because you can't get consistency. I didn't care so much about consistency. But the largest edition I ran, the smallest edition I ran was two. The largest edition I ever ran was 38, and that was considerably above it. But on average, I would run 25 to 30 colors on them. Now, I never learned printmaking. I always had to hire a master printer to work with me. My favorite paper was the Cat Mandu footprint one. Yeah, one of the, uh, what he's referring to is most of the papers were archival, but I did sort of make a deal with myself. If a paper was appealing enough and not archival, I was going to go with it anyhow. I just wasn't going to stack it in with my other stuff, and I'd let people know. And I had ordered these sheets of laminated paper from Kathmandu. I mean, I didn't have a connection with Kathmandu. I ordered them through some through New York Central Supply. They were doing a lot of handmade papers. But these were so handmade that you could see where they had taken like a wooden spoon or something and rubbed them to laminate them. Well, it turned out a whole lot of pieces came with mud on the bottom of them. Maybe two of the pieces had little baby footprints in mud, you know. I, I sort of imagine like, you say, Hey, uh, Tito, uh, off the paper, some American artist is going to use that <laughs> stuff. You don't want your footprints on it, you know? And I thought about that, and I took, I'd made two different editions, Kathmandu Eccentric and Kathmandu Tapestry. And, and I decided on the Kathmandu Eccentric, I'd use the muddy ones. And I'd use the mud on the front. And there's, with silk screens, which they got mixed up and all, there's no, no sense to how they were numbered except to identify them when you send them out. So I decided I'd line them up in terms of the muddiest to the cleanest. And I numbered the muddiest one, number one, and the cleanest one, whatever the highest number was. And when you look at where they went, all the artists and museums got low numbers. All the decorators got high numbers. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we got to get going here in a second, but I'll take one last question and then we'll close out. Go ahead. I wish we could have recorded that because I cannot rephrase that better than you asked it, but it's about the human quality of the paintings and you can answer the question, but try to rephrase it better than I did, Philip, because I wish we could have recorded what you said. I wish we could record what you said because you gave three quarters of the answer in the question. Exactly. Um, No, I don't think about that while I'm painting them. However, this conversational idea that I have about how to make the paintings, you know, that carries over to people viewing them. I hate didactic paintings. Didactic paintings feel to me like, I am the artist. I'm going to teach you something. Oh, come on. Who wants that crap? I wanted to start a conversation where it's interactive so that a lot of the message you get comes from you. Could I end this with a little experiment that sort of focuses on this? Okay, I'm going to ask everybody to shut your eyes. And imagine the best kiss you have ever had. Okay, open your eyes. Now, do another round here. Okay, everybody shut your eyes again. I want you to imagine the best kiss you've ever had. And the person you're kissing is about two inches taller than you. 
you're in a room that most of the room has 12 foot high ceilings, but there's some little stairs over to one side. And as you go up these three stairs, the, the ceiling's only 10 feet high, and that's where you're standing. The person you're kissing has lighter hair than you do. But, you know, one of the absolute totally amazing things about this person is that they had a perfect dental record as a kid. I mean, we're talking no cavities here. Okay, open your eyes. Which one had the most meaning? I'm not really asking you to answer. Ask for yourself. What you saw happening there was with every detail I gave you, I sucked meaning out of the experience. And I want these paintings not to do that. I want these paintings to kick you off well. Now, the initial question they ask, some questions may be better. Imagine the best kiss you ever had was probably a better question than think about what you might like for breakfast tomorrow. But the notion is to get something going here that makes that conversation. You know, people ask me sometimes about, like, where the buildings are from. I kind of don't want to answer the question because the buildings are in there as part of structuring it, but I want to leave that open for you. Now, I do look at specific things because there are details that happen that I wouldn't make up. In some of these, you see this, over in the yellow one, there's this format there where actually it's over to the right part of it near the top, there's this kind of thin leaning roof. And what that is, is it's, it's over a stairwell that goes up and on the end you can't see there's a door and you walk out onto the roof. I wouldn't have thought of that, but there it is, you know, and it's nice to make it more complex. All right, we've got to wrap up, but I want to thank you guys so much for coming and hope you guys come back. Thank you. <laughs>